It's supposed to be a community haven, but Blue Gum Hills Regional Park is being used and abused by all the wrong people. Over the last uh, couple of months we've been probably cautioning people more than anything, but we've reached the stage now where we're issuing infringements for, for people who are caught uh, undertaking illegal activities in the reserve. They're targeting vandals who have trashed a newly installed toilet system and smashed solar panels. Efforts are also focused on those who are illegally riding trail bikes through the bush. They're certainly a danger not only to themselves, um, riding at high speed in amongst the trees and, and the bushes here, but also to uh, other members of the public who are up here uh, legitimately using the park for recreation. Another huge problem is the illegal dumping of rubbish, which is hard to believe considering the tip is just one suburb away. We've got a, a state-of-the-art facility here in Newcastle in the Summerhill Waste Management Centre and it's the sort of place that they should be using all of the time rather than getting into public areas. The operation is part of a grand plan to turn the Blue Gum Hills Regional Park into a family friendly community area. So discouraging any negative behaviour is vital in ensuring this is a safe space. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. very impatient and undisciplined at times so uh, I thought mentally you know, we didn't handle it too well. With his wing well and truly clipped, injured Rosella's captain Ryan Daggles playing future is clouded to say the least, but there's nothing wrong with his coaching brain. While Souths got out of the blocks quickly at home, when Colin Clark has a full head of steam, the big back rower wasn't taking no for an answer and his charge to the line. It wasn't a pretty affair. The next try summed that up. Murray Parker picking up the scraps to scoot over and give the Rosellas a four-point lead. Halfback Sean Wallace found a similar route across the stripe to help West score a relieving win. At Carl Oval, the Seagulls had their tails up against the competition leaders, with Jason McKenzie feeding off some good lead-up work. It was desperation stuff at both ends for the home side, who denied the bay. Without their injured captain coach Ian Burke, hooker Scott Collins continues to play his part. After some luck with the kick, it was sleight of hand that had McKenzie in a game. Shell-shocked, the Bay went to the break down 24-0 and it got no prettier after half-time, as Lakes upset the Premiers by 26 points, which also ended the Blues' unbeaten run this season.
There was little but the shell of this North Rothbury house left today after it was completely gutted by fire at around five o'clock last night. Police and fire crews were called to the Thomas Street property after its female owner dialed triple O in distress from a neighbour's house. In court today it was alleged Paul Colin Philp had sprayed an unidentified accelerant inside the house during a domestic argument. Mr Philp, who had left the house, was arrested by police driving along Wine Country Drive at Cessnock a short time later. Police charged him with malicious damage by fire and remanded him in custody. The 36-year-old today appeared in Maitland Local Court where he was granted conditional bail. Magistrate Steve Jackson placed Mr Philp into the care of his mother at Nabiak and ordered him not to contact his ex-partner or go within one kilometre of the township of Rothbury. Investigations into the fire are continuing. The matter will next go before the court on the 29th of May. Christy Carter, NBN News. Eighty thousand locomotive lovers made the pilgrimage to Maitland at the weekend for Steamfest. Extremely successful, very happy, very pleased. The 21st birthday of the event received an extra special present to the tune of $1.1 million. The state government grant finally putting the long-awaited Heritage Steam Park back on track and securing the future of Steamfest. It'll hopefully allow us to have a presence, a permanent presence. Uh, and eventually something that is a museum as well that people will be able to go through every day of the week or you know, that's, that's the ultimate game. While a lengthy heritage assessment must be completed before the construction of the museum can begin, Maitland City Council is vowing to have it open by next year's Steam Fest. Well, I certainly hope it is. Uh, we've got a number of steps to go through um, with the building. The Steam Park, which will feature steam engine artefacts, will be housed at the Hunter Valley Training Company, the site of the old South Maitland Railway workshops. This just gives it that extra bit of momentum and the passing down of skills to trainees and apprentices uh, is the, the jewel in the crown for that site. Christy Carter, NBN News. About 5,000 people took part in last year's dawn service at Nobby's Beach. Tomorrow morning, the ceremony begins at 5 o'clock, featuring a salute from the guns at Fort Scratchley, paying tribute to the fallen. Bring your woolies and perhaps a, a pen light torch and uh, perhaps uh, some wet weather gear if the weather forecast holds fast. Yeah, we've been there six years now and every year it grows. It's, it's quite, it's lovely to see actually, It's because you're looking out over the water watching the sun rise, which is probably what they did at Gallipoli. You know, it really brings the point home. The Newcastle Anzac Day March begins at Pacific Park at 9.15 and will be led by Vietnam veterans, marking the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan. The march will bypass the mall because of those new shade structures following Scott Street before reaching Civic Park for a 10 o'clock service. Maitland's March starts at 10.35 before the service in Maitland Park. Cessnock's March follows Vincent and Cooper Streets from 11.15. Nelson Bay veterans will step it out from 10.40. The Swansea Parade starts at 11. Stockton from the Ferry Wharf at 8. And it's a 10.30 March in Scone. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
If the Knights players were still hurting from Saturday night, this morning's video session wouldn't have helped. Uh, not at all, but you've got you to learn from your mistakes, so it's uh, something we've got to do. It would have made painful viewing for everyone, especially Dan Toller, the young forward facing a month out after injuring his shoulder. He damaged it in this tackle during the second half, before copping a bell ringer from Mick Crocker minutes later to really rub it in. It broke his nose, but not his hearing. I just remember lying on the table with a shot of pethidine in me, lying on the table in the shed and just hearing the crowd. So obviously they kept scoring tries. Adam Woolnow's nose suffered a similar fate, while Josh Perry has his own dramas. As reported, he's facing two charges, the latter for contrary conduct after this. Reacting to Nathan Friend's attention, the club has until Wednesday to decide if they'll fight either charge. The Storm's Jake Webster can avoid suspension despite a dangerous throw in a game that wasn't big on discipline. The Knights now prepare to play South Sydney this weekend. Starting from second spot on the grid, it's a position Kevin Curtin is getting all too familiar with. Teammate Brock Parks began from the outside of the front row and he shot off the line. But by the first corner, Sebastian Charpentier had the lead, something he wouldn't lose. Parks diced his way around the Valencia circuit before setting himself up for a comfortable fourth place. While Curtin couldn't catch the Frenchman as the pair finished 1-2 for the third time this season as the margin separating them on the Riders' Championship begins to grow. Racing of the more natural kind in Newcastle's latest Group 1 winning Galloper County Tyrone has headed for a well-earned spell after winning the Sydney Cup at the weekend. He's seven but he, you know, he's racing like he's still only four. I think that was his career best run so I won't be, won't be retiring just yet. Lees already has hopes for his charges next campaign. I can we'll bring him back and um, you know, I'd like to try and win a Newcastle Cup with him if possible if he's not uh, too hammered with the weights. Attention for Lees now switches to Adelaide for the first time where he'll saddle up the best rated maiden in the country, Flora Danica. She's ran second in two um, oaks to such a great horse in Serenade Rose. She's the dominant three-year-old filly and she won't be in Adelaide so um, that's what we're going there trying to chase another group one with her. Yeah, you've got a fair way to get away from Serenade Rose, haven't you? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Hamilton Olympic wasted no time creating opportunity. Getting it past Adamstown's goalkeeper, though, was a whole new challenge. Some early rough and tumble laid the foundations for what would be a busy night for the referee. Hamilton penalised on this occasion, only to score seconds later. What looked like a textbook save went on to hand Hamilton a one-goal lead. Within minutes, Olympic led by two. Approaching half-time, the Rosebuds enjoyed some possession and didn't they make it count? Adamstown's custodian did well to stop this effort, but another attempt by Hamilton sent alarm bells ringing through the Rosebuds camp. Olympic going on to win 4-1 and sit on top of the ladder after two rounds. Edgeworth and Azuri are in the chase as well, while Adamstown and Weston remain in the cellar.
At Lake Macquarie, a new generation is filling the spaces left by those veterans who are no longer with us. A small march and ceremony at Valentine saw the young and not-so-young standing side by side to honour the fallen. The youngsters were also out in force at Swansea for today's march. Every year, more and more littlies are pinning on their granddad or great granddad's medals and stepping it out proudly as part of a grand learning process about our world wars. Some in the ranks of the RSL believe it's taking attention away from the veterans, but by far most realise that without the youngsters, Anzac Day has a limited future. If they don't attend, in a few years there'll be no Anzac Day parades because there'll be no one else left. I think they should be. <laughs> Carry on the tradition. Was their father or their grandfather? That's good. Cody Ann Milton carried her great granddad's photo today. Richard Ernest Milton served on the Kokoda track and only passed away last year aged 86. The whole family marched today to remember him. Because I feel honoured to be able to represent my great grandfather in this time because he went to war and fought for everything. Dad passed away in October, it's still early days and so we just do this and enjoy each other's company for the rest of the day. How does it make you feel seeing all the family here today? I'm very proud. Jake's father Bruce has always been his son's caddy in more ways than one. When he was a baby I used to put him in the backpack and walk down the golf course and sit him down wide and mess around a bit. After a few years, he started hitting a little club around. Much like his game, though, Jake's set of clubs only grew from there. He plays off a handicap of five, has a string of junior state titles to his credit already and is among the country's top-ranked 12-year-olds. Yeah, I like Tiger Woods and James Nitties and then and Ernie Els because they're all good players and they've got nice swings. And his coach Mark Rainey likens Jake to a young James Nitties, a now golfing professional who also hails from Charlestown. Ever since he started his golf, we've always said, um, you know, you won't become a champion, champion golfer until you're about 20. So he's got another eight years to, to, to improve his golf already. Having seen the images of a young Tiger Woods and his subsequent success, Jake and his parents are well aware of the pressure placed on golfing progeny. Honestly, at the moment, it's his sport. He's good at it. He loves doing it, and that's what you know. That's what we we play it for. A game he gave up representative cricket for, with plenty to look forward to. I'd like to go professional, but I've got a lot of golf ahead of me. So. And in the Upper Hunter, Mother Nature turned on a beautiful blue sky day. Thousands lined the streets of Singleton to witness the march and honour those who forged a defining chapter in Australian history. Children marched adorned with the medals of their forefathers, national pride on display. At the Burdekin Park Anzac service, crowds joined in solemn remembrance. and in song. The ceremony is much about remembering the past as it was about looking to the future. We used to say that the ranks of the original Anzacs were thinning with each passing year. They are all gone now. And what swells with each Anzac season is a hunger for their stories, especially by the younger generation of Australia. 114 soldiers, more than 20% of Singleton's population in 1915, were killed in World War I. Wreaths today placed underneath the town cenotaph in their honour. The 25th of April 1915 will forever be a part of what it means to be in Australia. The day soon gave way to another wartime tradition. Rural pubs flooded with punters keen to revel in a game of two-up. And it didn't seem to matter if you were betting $5 or 50. Gamblers held their breath to see just which way the coins would fall. Christy Carter, NBN News.
In the chilly morning air, blanketed in darkness, a record 6,000 people gathered at Nobby's Beach, among them 300 war veterans. It was a solemn but stirring service, the crowd paying their respects to those Australians who fought and those who fell, sacrificing their lives in battle. For many, the beachside setting provokes images of the Gallipoli Landing, where the Anzac tradition was born. To sand here and listen to the waves lapping on the shore, um, if you can take that in and just reflect back to what those soldiers must have thought back in those days in 1915 when they were first stepped ashore, it does really set the scene. The Fort Scratchley guns were fired. The shots paying tribute to the fallen. Once the damp dawn service was complete, sunrise revealed the size of the crowd. On to Stockton and with medals jingling, former servicemen and women made their way along Mitchell Street towards the Cenotaph. Despite recent controversy, no complaints here about young descendants participating in the march. I think the future of Anzac Day is with the children, with the younger generations. Led by the Vietnam vets marking their 40th anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan, the Newcastle March attracted thousands. And a new plaque was unveiled to honour all service women who served their country. I feel this plaque today has said to the girls, we remember, we appreciate what you've done. And a reunion of sorts for one family, three generations of soldiers, a rat of Tobruk, a Vietnam veteran, while the youngest is about to head off to Iraq, a reminder that, unfortunately, peace is still not with us. The standoff began at this Redwood Place property at around 9 o'clock on Sunday night after police went to the house about another inquiry. Police allege a 40-year-old Gateshead man confronted them with a firearm before barricading himself inside the house. The siege ended on Anzac morning when the man peacefully surrendered to police. Scott Michael Fear today faced Newcastle local court on seven charges, including threatening to use a weapon to prevent police investigation, common assault and possessing an unauthorised firearm. Today's brief court appearance didn't shed any light on the reason behind the lengthy standoff. Mr Fear sat silent in the dock as his legal representative requested a medical report be carried out on the Gateshead man. Scott Fear was refused bail with the matter adjourned until the 22nd of May. Christy Carter, NBN News. It's been another busy holiday period at Newcastle Airport and it's not over yet, with 5,000 passengers expected to pass through the gates this weekend alone. While some carriers have already been forced to increase fares to cover rising jet fuel costs, those in Newcastle haven't followed suit. Ticket prices remain steady and with road travel becoming more expensive, many are setting their sights skywards. What we're actually seeing is probably people looking at air travel as an alternative to car travel, where indeed their fuel prices have an impact as well. A spokesperson for Jetstar says the cost of a ticket will go up if crude oil prices continue to bite, but the carrier will do what it can to absorb those costs. We understand that the market is price sensitive and I know the airlines understand that as well, so they obviously work as much as they can in keeping those price impacts to a minimum. While the airport is enjoying steady growth, it's made the process of finding a parking space even tougher. The situation is expected to become much worse from next week when construction begins on a new car park and a designated pickup zone outside the airport. Passengers are being encouraged to exercise patience and to leave plenty of time to find a park. Colleen West, NBN News. Balancing more than $145 million worth of expenditure and revenue is no easy task, but Lake Macquarie City Council believes it's achievable. We've balanced the budget this year, but it's been very hard. We have had to significantly cut our, uh, our financing of uh, some areas, uh, operational areas and certainly some capital works. The draft budget goes on public exhibition next week, with the biggest bite, $13.5 million, going towards road maintenance. 
Rates will remain at the 3.6% capped rate, with the council not applying for a special variation. However, Mayor Piper has suggested an increase may be necessary in the 2007 to 2008 financial year. I think that there's a clear indication that we will need to do that, particularly if we're going to provide the services and the, the quality of uh, infrastructure that the community are demanding. The Council has proposed to introduce a stormwater management service charge of $5.85 for relevant properties and a special rate for the Belmont commercial area, while the $19 environmental levy to help keep the lake clean will continue. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. Like today's training venue, there's a change too in the playing roster as the new look Knights prepare to meet Souths on Sunday. Veteran prop Luke DeVico races into the top squad, promoted after three games in Premier League. I've still probably got, you know, two or three weeks, I think, maybe till I'm back to where I want to be, but uh, it's been a good, good hit out for me. And yeah, I mean, he was brought here to, to do a job up front, and I think that's you know, what he intends to do for the rest of the year. Named on the bench, DeVico will make his first grade debut for the Knights, while Dustin Cooper has also fought his way into the squad of 17. It's been a big learning curve for me, I suppose. Been a back my whole life and now I'm in the back row, so just um, adds versatility, I suppose, to, to myself and gives Hayes another option. Cleared of any serious facial injuries, Adam Woolno replaces the suspended Josh Perry, who's taken the early guilty plea set to miss three games. Yeah, he'd be disappointed, obviously, not to be there for um, you know, city, country, and Origin games around the corner. So, uh, yeah, that's something that I guess uh, if he had his time over, he'd, he'd probably reassess things a bit. And proof today what a difference a quick warm-up makes. The injured Andrew Johns toiling with that troublesome ankle before finding his feet. These illustrations now hanging on the walls of the Lovett Gallery at Newcastle Regional Library bring to life the essence of the land through the eyes of Aboriginal artist Bronwyn Bancroft. The vibrant works are the original illustrations that help to tell the story of The Outback, a book written by 11-year-old Tamworth student Annalise Porter. And I just loved the language in the text. I thought I could just see the images just straight away. And so I thought, what a wonderful thing to work with this. 11 year old girl and you know make these beautiful images you know about the bush. Today the artist was sharing her illustrative skills with the next generation proving you're never too young to take artistic direction. I think it's essential that children to, you know have a link to creativity because it helps decrease mental health problems and makes people feel happy. Newcastle Library will run another art workshop for children tomorrow, with all illustrations set to go on display during Indigenous Reconciliation Week in May. Christy Carter, NBN News. Mingling with future pharmacists during a farewell barbecue at the University of Newcastle today, Professor Shane Scott had mixed feelings about leaving the program he helped set up. This time's always bittersweet to have the time when you're leaving a program where the students have been here, you've got to know them, they're developing into good professionals. But at the same time, he's looking forward to the new challenge of chairing the Department of Pharmacy practice at Chicago's Midwestern University. 
they're going to increase the research profile and the scholarly activity. So part of my role is actually to, to lead that and to develop the faculty and staff to the next level. Also at the University today, recognition for one of the region's most dedicated teachers. Ms Jeanette Rotherfell, also known as Ms Rocket Fuel because of her passion for space science, received an honorary degree for her contribution to school education. When you are honoured in this way, you realise that your work has been worthwhile. Ms Rotherfell was instrumental in bringing some of NASA's moon rocks to Australia as a learning resource. In January, people on the Tilligree Peninsula gathered in numbers to raise concerns about a large build-up of bushfire fuel and a lack of hazard reduction burns. Since then, the Rural Fire Service has studied the area and the report back is there's nothing to worry about. The residents on the peninsula are not exposed to any greater or lesser risk than anyone else living in a bushfire prone area in New South Wales or for that matter Australia. Locals who suggested the bay was ready for a Canberra-style firestorm were given a dressing down at last night's meeting. I was roundly criticised by some people with a particular interest in this matter uh, for suggesting that a Canberra event cannot occur on this peninsula. And I say that because it can't. Mr Koperberg says the study shows that fuel levels in the area aren't as high as was claimed by some. Of course there will be fires on the peninsula, as there will be everywhere else in New South Wales. But to suggest that, that your community is at any greater risk than perhaps uh, other parts of New South Wales, I, I find um, uh, impossible to, uh, an, an argument impossible to sustain. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Marilyn Christie's husband, Alan, died in May last year from cancer. When chemotherapy failed to work, the couple went to Rutherford naturopath Paul Perrett, who charged thousands of dollars for tablets that were later found to have few, if any, active ingredients. It would stop the cancer going to the brain. It would uh, work on all the cells. It would uh, retard the cancer cells and um, help him generally right through. And what did it do? It didn't do anything. It didn't do anything. It didn't help. Thousands of patients put their faith in Perrot, whose clinic near Newcastle has now been shut down by the government. His activities were at the centre of today's parliamentary hearing in Lake Macquarie. The Healthcare Complaints Commission is already investigating Mr Perrot. I know that the Fair Trading Minister Di Beamer has already taken some action against him and we hope that by getting new laws, uh, actions that Mr Perrot has undertaken and other people like him will be able to be stamped out in New South Wales. It will make a difference and people won't get sucked in like we did. Paul Lobb, NBN News. A staggering 144 people have died in house fires across the state in the past five years. Lives which, according to the New South Wales Fire Brigade, could have been saved by a smoke alarm. In an effort to reduce the tragic statistic, smoke alarms will be compulsory in all units, apartments and houses from next Monday. The changes in legislation came about following um, some tragedies back in um, 2005 in June. We lost about, was about 13 fatalities in a short period of time. Research shows 60% of fire deaths in the last five years occurred during sleeping hours. Smoke won't wake somebody. It's something that people do think. It's a mistake that people make is that smoke will wake them, but it won't. It will just render them unconscious and they'll just lapse into a full-time sleep. The brigade says smoke alarms aren't the only way to make a home more fire safe. It recommends clearing gutters, regular checks of electrical appliances, not leaving heaters unattended or overloading power boards as just some of the ways to reduce fire risk. We'd like to get families to not only have escape plans but to practice them at night, get the kids involved and so they've got means of our oh, method of getting out of the fire, out of the house should a fire occur.
On the surface, Saddam Woolno's facial injury looked pretty ordinary last weekend. Even today, the battle scars still showed. It's hardly enough to sideline the young prop, though. Woolno will start in Sunday's match with everything where it should be. The, the doc put, put the nose back into place and it's uh, feeling not too bad. And it's an opportunity I didn't want to give up. Uh, no matter what sort of injury it was, uh, I've spoken to Neil Halpin and he thinks everything will be fine. It's a new look forward pack to meet the Rabbitohs. The Knights acknowledging calls to better service their halves pairing of young Jarrett Mullen and Kurt Gidley. A little pact uh, between Craig Smith, myself and Luke DeVico. We really want to let Joey or Mullo or Kurt, whoever's there, to um, have a bit of room behind us. For the young number seven, he's well aware of the pressure that comes with being chief playmaker. We haven't uh, played up to our uh, expectations of everyone, uh, what they think we should be playing like, but um, hopefully get out there this weekend and, um, yeah, do, show them what we can do. And Newcastle knows only too well what Adam McDougall can do. The former Knight set to make his return from injury for the Rabbitohs. I haven't played against him yet, so, um, yeah, it'll be great. He's a great competitor and uh, he's a fairly strong silver bloke as well, so I'm sure he'll play well for them. The Knights hope not too well. They call Daniel Aman the Doberman. He's big, tall, got a growl to him, so that's I suppose helps. It's in this Wickham gym where the 23-year-old is preparing for his first professional title fight. Chasing the New South Wales Pro Cruiserweight title, Aman will fight Wollongong's Mick O'Donnell for the belt in what will be their third matchup. Yeah, he wouldn't fight me again if he wasn't confident of uh, being able to beat me in for the state title as well. He's very fit, there's an extra two rounds, anything could happen. In this case though, history is on the side of Aman, with 25-year-old O'Donnell beaten on both occasions by points decisions. I mean, I'm not going to say anything about the referee, but I mean, I, it was very close. And... Making it more of a challenge for the visitor, O'Donnell is preparing for a Southpaw fighter. He's even called on the help of the Bulleye Blaster, Shannon Taylor. But it matters not to the Stockton boxer, who's kept his preparation simple. Um, his footwork's very good anyhow, his fitness is always excellent. So he's just been working on putting combinations together now, punches in bunches. Over the last 12 months, Bob Lawrence has had nothing but bad news regarding his daughter's predicament. But finally, some good news from Bali. Yeah, it was great, you know, uh, to come from life where we'd never see her back here to 20 years when, you know, who knows, you know, could be 15, 10. Five of the drug mules had their sentences cut to 20 years following an appeal to the Bali High Court. It's believed Renee's sentence was reduced because she claimed she had played a relatively minor role in the conspiracy to smuggle heroin to Australia. She's over the moon. Hmm. Hopefully it is reduced to 20 years, but it's not confirmed as yet. It's been a year since we last caught up with Bob Lawrence at home in Newcastle. Back then he was distraught, still coming to terms with the gut-wrenching news that his beloved daughter may face the death penalty. 
And while the High Court appeal win has lifted his spirit slightly, the pain of the ordeal and of being separated from his daughter is still evident. And while Bob's a pensioner and says he can't afford it, he's still hoping he can travel to Denpasar in the future. His next concern, Renee's ally and friend, Martin Stevens, who lost his appeal against his life sentence. Uh, I honestly thought Martin would get the same. Yeah. And I hope he can appeal and, and I hope he can do better. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. When it comes to new courthouses, this is what $10 million of taxpayers' money will buy. A courtroom with light and airy surrounds, calming colour schemes and low furniture designed to make kids feel comfortable, no matter what the reason for their appearance. Bear in mind that some of the children who come here have been offenders, but some of the children who come here, in fact the majority, are actually victims. And they need to be made to feel comfortable. Video links allow child victims of abuse to give evidence from a remote location to avoid facing their alleged attackers, while the whole complex is guarded by the latest in airport-style security. The Attorney-General says the children's court system is strongly focused on the rehabilitation of youngsters. Uh, that the whole circumstance is one in which children are made to feel uh, uh, reasonably comfortable uh, and as if that they are in a situation where people are trying to help them rather than in a situation where people are trying to uh, intimidate and browbeat them. a negotiation and a consultation in which the community at large has got to come to some kind of settlement. That's the, that's the way it is and that's the way it's happened on a number of occasions already. I'm sure it'll be like that again. The Harvey family know firsthand the struggle of raising a daughter with a disability. Seven-year-old Eliza was diagnosed with Angelman syndrome at 13 months of age, a rare condition which renders her immobile and unable to speak. Today the Harveys were giving thanks to companies whose donations have helped to make life easier for their family at the launch of the 50 Kindest Companies Register. All the funding um, that is available throughout these sort of organisations and charities just means so much to children like Eliza. The brainchild of Newcastle charity Life Activities 50 Kindest Companies is a website that acknowledges local organisations that help people in need in the Hunter region by donating money or services. Their contribution might be a couple of hundred dollars from their tip jar every few months but it all counts and everybody's contribution is equal. Uh, in our eyes. The kindest companies will pay a one-off fee to register which like money raised from the annual Music and Moonlight event will go directly to disability services. Corporate insurance brokers earned its kindest company tag for offering a discount on insurance costs, money that's been ploughed back into services for the disabled. So if you've got a heart and there's some blood running through your body you've just got to help. Christy Carter, NBN News. This group of women has been meeting for 10 weeks. Before too long, they'll be visiting Aboriginal families in the Singleton Musselbrook areas who have under school aged children and need support. Sometimes, as women, we do need just that extra helping hand so that we have somebody there to bounce ideas off and to have a couple with. It's an upper hunter first for the Home Start program where the volunteers are all Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. There's a big need for this in, in the community because there is um, a lot of, like I said, young mothers um, who need that support. The volunteers will assist Aboriginal families to begin with, offering support in the privacy of their home with a flexible approach to different needs. As a volunteer they're going to be looking at being an aunt to the child. Um, which is really important in isolated areas, and being a friend to the mum. I get a great sense of achievement out of actually 
helping people and just seeing their smile and saying thank you, that's enough. Adam McIlreek, NBN News. The Krusty Demons have been thrilling crowds for years, but now there's a girl busting the big moves. Scary Mary Perkins is the world's first female Krusty Demon rider and she's not afraid to mix it with the boys. You've got to be tough, you've just got to stand your ground and I mean they're pretty awesome to me, they're really encouraging and you know happy to see a girl out there. Freestyle motocross is not for the faint hearted with adrenaline packed aerials and daredevil tricks keeping audiences on the edge of their seats. Rubber matting is used for the show to ensure the ground remains fit for the next league round. Well, the rubber we use is specific rubber and it actually sits off the grass and lets the grass breathe. And if warm-ups are anything to go by, tomorrow night is sure to be an action-packed show of gravity-defying tricks. We expect the riding to go up another notch because once these people get together and they go on a long tour, they tend to push each other and they're developing new tricks as they go. Renee Murphy, NBN News. The winless South Sydney Rabbitohs are in familiar territory at the bottom of the ladder, unfortunately, having their worst start since 1996. And when they took on the Warriors last week, it was obvious. An inability to build any pressure at all in attack due to poor ball handling and an average kicking game is a problem the club just has to address. But it was their defensive misses that plundered South into their worst performance all year. Basic one-on-one -on -one tackles were regularly missed and Warriors front rower Reuben Wickey scored two tries that told the story of South's defensive woes. He powered around them or straight through them with scant regard. Now South has shown some patches in form this year, having a half-time lead or a good start only to find a way to lose. Now through frustration, the head coach Sean McRae publicly asked their supporters not to criticise and be patient. Now given injuries to their playing roster, it's fair enough. And also the fact that the club is in a state of transition with new ownership, the announcement that Jason Taylor will be assistant coach next year, and also the fact that Sean McRae himself hasn't long taken over is a positive sign for improvement in the club. But they need to win and win soon. And it doesn't get any easier for the Rabbitohs. They play, of course, the Knights who were badly beaten last week against the Storm and out for revenge. Souths have always been renowned as fighters, are gritty and determined, and they'll need to be. The next three games include the Storm, Panthers and the Roosters. Let's see some spirit. On to round eight tonight, I like the Panthers. Saturday, Cowboys, Broncos and Storm. And Sunday, it's the Bulldogs, Knights and Seagulls. Have a great weekend. See you next week. When betting was suspended on the Knights Rabbitohs game late yesterday, bookmakers were guessing Andrew Johns was right to play, but the final decision will come tomorrow. I spoke to him briefly today, and um, you know he was happy enough with what he got through today. But you know, I guess getting through a, a little bit this morning and then getting through a full session is another matter. So we'll give him that opportunity and take it from there. The coach may also become a casual observer of a rival code tomorrow night with the AFL match set down to play on the questionable Telstra Stadium surface. Oh, I guess they'd need to review um, the Swans game on Saturday night pretty closely and then see how it is in the morning. With the Australian team to be picked after Sunday's games, Steve Simpson will be out to further his case. The second rower withdrew from the Tri-Nations campaign last season and is fighting to get his way back. It would be nice to be part of that, but um, there's still a game ahead, so I can't get too far ahead of myself. And the club will fight that salary cap breach with the NRL that carries a possible fine of just over $11,000. The salary cap isn't a uh, perfect instrument. Um, there are faults in it, as far as I'm concerned. We're, we're a victim of one of those. A supporter of the cap on the whole, the club will argue their breach was simply unavoidable under the current rules. Jim Callanan, NBN News. A week out of their first game and the Newcastle team had gone to the dogs. The side presented with their jumpers today between events at the gardens, but despite the new look in terms of personnel, the message remains the same. If we put in a bad performance, we don't get invited back the next week. The knockout phase, so we need to be at our best week in, week out over the course of the campaign. For Jai Hill, it's a little bittersweet. Dumped midweek to reserve grade at his club Nelson Bay, his Newcastle coach has no such dramas. He was very close to selection last year and he was the first back row pick this year, so that's proof in the pudding that uh, we think is a vital component of our team. 
All club games this weekend are on Sunday with West and old rivals Lakes at Harker Roval while Cessnock makes the journey to take on a Bayside smarting from its first loss of the year. In Newcastle and Hunter Rugby, Nelson Bay and Merriweather are among those playing at home while the undefeated University heads up the valley to meet the Bulls. And in NBN soccer, South Cardiff and Phoenix will be one to watch as will the clash at Highfields. And Newcastle rowing clubs, Hugh McLeod, has earned selection in the Australian under-23s Quad Skulls crew for the world champs in Amsterdam mid-year. It's the second year he's made the team. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Northern Division may have mixed it with North Coast early in the piece, but it was all downhill after that with the North Coast taking control and never letting go. They blew out to a 40 points to 16 lead before Northern managed to add some respectability to the scoreline, eventually going down by 24. In Rugby Union, New South Wales country representatives were missing from today's club fixtures in the Newcastle and Hunter competition, but it didn't really come into play at Merriweather, who got off to an opportunistic start against Maitland with Luke Dan crossing. The Blacks coming up against a wall of green in defence. But hunting out wide bore greater success for winger Craig Clark. In contrast, they wouldn't have been happy with their own defence, with Luke Kermode making it look a little too easy. Fullback Wade Gibson then timed his run to perfection. Just before half time, he sliced through for the home side's third to take them to the sheds up 21 8 at half time. Back directing his side today, Andrew John's left ankle still causes some pain, but his return must have a few bookmakers feeling well off colour. They suspended betting on the Knights Rabbitohs game on Thursday after plungers suggested he'd play and today it was looking like smart money. Structurally there's no problem so there's no reason why I can't play. The comeback though is earlier than he would have liked. Injured during the narrow loss to the Cowboys, he then missed that hammering by the storm. His return all about club, not country, even with next Friday's test against the Kiwis. Playing next week for the test is going to be sensational. I'm looking forward to that, but my main focus is, is club footy and, and that's why I'm playing tomorrow. It allows everyone to just focus on doing their job well and, and we can uh, you know, hopefully go into the game with a bit of confidence. That's easier said than done in terms of the Telstra Stadium surface. Recently re-turfed, everyone will have an eye on tonight's Swans-Geelong AFL game played at the same venue. They you know, jumped up and down about the ground, so it's going to be interesting to see how it is. I just hope it stands up tonight all right and, and uh, I guess tomorrow morning, you know, make sure it, it's uh, suitable for us tomorrow afternoon. Fraser Park is a popular stretch of coast for rock fishing, an area which has seen countless rescue attempts in the past, many of them ending in tragedy. It never ceases to amaze us that the number of times that fishermen do end up in the water. This time it was a man and a woman swept off the rocks and with the beach itself closed, lifeguards feared the worst. Luckily one of the fishermen got washed back onto the rocks and was able to get out himself, but uh, yeah, we continued searching for... 10 minutes. Assisted by the Westpac rescue helicopter, lifeguards Stuart Sawyer and Brooke Castle found the 36-year-old woman alive. Treated for minor injuries in the beach car park, the woman was then airlifted to Gosford Hospital. 
the condition of the of uh, the person who uh, has gone into the water is still being monitored, but no, certainly a terrific uh, result today. After tomorrow, though, lifeguards stop patrolling the beach for another season. And with no mobile phone or two-way radio reception at Fraser Park, authorities are warning rock fishermen help won't be as easy to come by. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. Be it target practice... Learning how to smother an oil fire. Or just making sure that siren works. It's all part and parcel of life in the fire brigade. A life Jodie Cummings and Kerry Lee MacDonald were desperate to be part of as visitors to the Minmai station found today more women are signing up to be firefighters. They fit in well with the guys and uh, they perform the same duties as the fellas. I think it's um, a sign of the times that women are allowed to join and it's great and I certainly um, hope more women do. There was a call to arms too for Hunter residents. As of Monday, every home in New South Wales must have a smoke alarm. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. As of tomorrow, only three of the 13 beaches between Tea Gardens and Catherine Hill Bay will be regularly patrolled. Volunteer lifesavers have taken down the flags for the final time this season, handing responsibility over to council lifeguards and beach inspectors. Nobbies and Bar Beach will be open all year, as well as Newcastle Ocean Bars, on that winter patrol, which is 8am in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon, seven days a week. But while the surf lifesavers may have finished patrols for another summer, work in one shape or another will continue through the cooler months. We've got uh, training going on uh, with the rescue boat behind us uh, all, all, all winter probably, uh, racing seasons and, uh, and new recruiting drives coming up. Council pools at Mayfield, Walls End, Beresfield and Stockton have also closed. However, Lampton Swimming Centre will continue to operate for another four weeks. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. The fabrics that get used nowadays are amazing. There's bamboo and hemp and um, flannelette. 